thank you for being here tonight. Um, like I said, this is our final green living class for the fall. This is sustainable landscape design. Um, again, Joanne Toms with the City of Glendale Water Services Department. Also with me is Ann Staley with the City of Glendale Water Services Department. She's a big part of the success of this class series. Um, Ann set up the Zoom uh, schedules and has been facilitating all of the uh, technical, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So um, Ann is responsible for this series. So thank you, Ann. And then also here tonight is Ryan Wood. Um, and so we're just glad that you guys are here. This is great. All right, so I'm gonna go over some of the webinar logistics. Um, just so that all of you know, the attendees, you'll be muted and the session will be recorded. You can type your questions and comments in the Q&A or the chat function. And Ann and I will be reading them and responding them throughout the webinar. Uh, the class is uh, about one and a half hours. So we'll have about an hour or so for the formal presentation and then about half an hour for the Q&A. If you experience any significant technical uh, issues, please feel free to contact Ann Staley. Uh, you can call her at 623-930-3550, or you can also email her at A-S-T-A-H-L-E-Y at glendaleaz.com. So you'll see that on the slide. And then we will follow up uh, with an email and that email will have the PowerPoint, uh, any of the handouts, the recording and a link to the survey. And if you complete the survey, you will be entered to win a free gift card uh, to Elgin Nursery. Um, so make sure that you fill out the survey and we've been trying to give away um, like a little freebie at each class just because we wanted to make it fun and we really do appreciate your feedback about these classes. Um, especially since we're doing them virtually, which is really different than what we've done in the past. So the Zoom attendee features, um, I like to kind of go over this just so that you're getting comfortable with uh, Zoom. So you can control your features in the sense that you can make your presentation bigger, you can make the presenter's image bigger. All you need to do is just kind of toggle uh, this arrow here. You can make the present presenter picture bigger or the presentation bigger, like I said. And then if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see there's a Q&A where you can ask questions here. And then you can also um, put in your questions or comments in the chat as well. So um, feel free to do that. You're not gonna disturb Ryan because Ann and I will be moderating that. So keep the questions coming because I find that that really makes the class really fun, especially at the end when we have so many uh, questions to ask our expert. And then um, because we're talking about landscaping and designing in particular, this is a really great publication uh, that the city of Glendale has. We can mail you a copy of this publication, uh, Landscaping with Style, or if you wanna check it out online, you can do that as well. And um, here's the URL. The easiest way to get it really is just to Google AMWA. So AMWA stands for the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association. Um, and just type in AMWA and then landscape guide in the search function and you'll, you'll find that guide. But here's the URL if you're quick and you wanna write it down. Um, but if you want me to snail mail you a copy of the guide, I'm happy to do that. I'm old school. I like books, I like guides. I like to write and stuff and highlight and put stickers on. Um, just call me or email me and I'll mail you a copy of the guide. So you've got some options there. And then another thing, because this is about design, um, I always encourage people to visit as many gardens as you can. And so there's a lot of public gardens. Um, you can go to the Water Use It Wisely site and you can search for demonstration gardens. Again, that website is waterusitwisely.com. There's a great little search function in there and just type in demonstration garden and almost every city in the Phoenix metro area has a demonstration garden. Um, some of them are a little bit smaller than others. Some are, you know, you can spend the whole day there. So definitely check them out because you're going to see plants in a more mature form than you would necessarily at a nursery. And so you can really um, tell whether or not that plant's going to fit in your landscape. Because again, good design is always about the right plant in the right place. Um, that's just a, a core tenant of design. And then I'm really excited to welcome uh, Ryan Wood. 
And so Ryan is uh, representing the Watershed Management Group tonight. Um, he shares, he will share with you his extensive knowledge in water harvesting and permaculture design, along with his skills and enthusiasm for creating sustainable livelihoods. Ryan applies his talents while educating the public through hands-on workshops, presentations, and consultations. Um, so Ryan, thank you so much for being here. Just always, um, I'm so excited when you're one of our presenters. Um, so, all right, Ryan, I'm gonna pass the screen on you. I'm gonna stop sharing. So thank you, Ryan. Uh, you're very welcome, Joanne. Thank you. And, uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for attending tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and get my, um, I'll start sharing my screen here. Okay, now you should be able to see the presentation on your screen. And I, again, thank you, Joanne and Anne. I appreciate, uh, uh, and I'm really happy to be here tonight and excited. As Joanne mentioned, my name is Ryan Wood. I'm, a, I'm with Ryan Wood Design. I'm a consultant, educator, and a designer. And I really like the education side of it. I just truly love sharing what I know. And uh, especially with tonight, the sustainable landscape design. Because if we're going to be creating a design they should be sustainable. We should be thinking of ways of how to um, create our landscapes so that way they are sustainable. So as far as our water, where's where that coming from? The plants that we plant, you know, are they are they adapted? Or are they native to this area? You know, so those are the kind of things that when creating a sustainable landscape is how to integrate those in. So we're going to cover lots of that tonight. All right. So we're going to uh, you know, the big part of thinking about your, your sustainable landscape design is, well, what are your goals? What do you have uh, in mind for your project? What are you wanting to achieve? And as I mentioned earlier, you know, when thinking about a sustainable, well, if even if it goes on beyond sustainable and it's regenerative, something that doesn't uh, just sustain, but can grow and build on from there. So things that I think about is uh, definitely water conservation. When creating your, your design, you want to think about the water use. So when you're planting different plants and trees, what's their water requirement? What do they need? And uh, there's definitely some good publications out there. And, and uh, Joanne, Joanne I'm, I'm old school too. I, I love the, you know, the printed copies, but this is also a good version online. The AMWA, Arizona Municipal Waters User Associations. This is the plant guide. And uh, it definitely... Um, it's worth looking through there for selecting your plants. It has great information on well, what's the water requirements. It's, they have a little raindrop there. If it's no uh, blue in the drop, it's very low. If there's a little bit, it's low water or moderate water use. And these are all good plants to be planting within our sustainable landscape. So definitely a good resource there. Um, gosh, another resource, this is old school, you know, how to water. So if you are gonna be irrigating your plants, you know, with the hose, drip irrigation, or you know, even maybe gray water and, and rainwater. This is a good guide to show you how much does your plants need. And so definitely a lot of resources out there, but water conservation is a key part of it. So we don't wanna be creating landscapes that are just gonna draw a lot of water and a lot of resources. So rainwater harvesting is one good approach when thinking of your goals. And it definitely should be on your list because rainwater harvesting here in Arizona is perfectly legal. And not all states can say that. And so we should be thinking about how we can capture, how to slow spread and sink that rainwater within our landscapes. If it's rushing off into the street, well, we've just, we missed that resource. We get to use it as a beneficial resource on our site. In those big heavy storms and we get an overflow, that, that's good. That's what the stormwater system's for. But it's also thinking of what it was like before all the development here, um, for the, all the impervious surfaces. And where was that water going before? Well, it was, a lot of it was just sponging in right on site before it started to run. So trying to replicate that, that um, you know, what it was like before all the impervious surfaces. We want to create that sponge. Beauty and aesthetics, definitely, when creating your sustainable landscape. This is a key. Uh, beauty for us, aesthetics, for sh definitely for sure. You know, wildlife habitat is really important because the wildlife that uh, is attracted to our urban areas, they, they need the type of plants within this area so that they can survive. And the type of plants that they like, if we put those in our, in our uh, yards, we're gonna attract those type of, um, those uh, different wildlife, the birds and, and uh, definitely the pollinators are really attracted to a lot of the plants that we have here um, and 
that grows well here in the desert. And creating that livable outdoor space. Because we do live in a desert, and I know this seems a little crazy when it gets to, you know, 115 or, gosh, continually 100 degrees for over 100 days, but it's also a good uh, location to, to spend a lot of time outside with the right amount of shade because we do live in that arid climate. So creating those livable outdoor spaces that's going to provide the right shade during the time of day, then we can go out and enjoy our, our beautiful landscapes that we're creating. Enjoy all that wildlife that uh, we're going to attract. Definitely saving money raises property values. That's one, you know, I never thought of until we, uh, <laughs> shopping for our home in 1998, really it was, it was our first home. And for me at that time, what I was thinking is I want low maintenance in the front yard. And then in the backyard, you know, it wasn't, I, I knew I could do anything I want, but in the front yard, I was looking for it. two desert trees, an ocotillo and a red yucca, N you know, not too specific, right? But <laughs> it took a long time, but we actually, we did it, that. We found a house with exactly that, but it was all the other things that the house attracted us to. But the value that those two trees, that Ocotillo and the Red Yucca added to the home and the, the attraction, and definitely when saving money too, when planting your trees to where it can cast a shadow onto your house, so all the walls, windows, and doors at the right time of day, you're also gonna save energy, which saves water. So when we're saving water, we're saving energy and vice versa, because they're two, or tightly knitted together. So how do you start? And where do you start? Well, where I like to start is always with the principles of water harvesting. And this is uh, <laughs> another book, great resource. This is Brad Lancaster, uh, Rain, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond. Uh, Brad Lancaster, he's known as the guru down in Tucson for rainwater harvesting. And, and this is the book I picked up in 2007 and just started changing my life when thinking about how to use our rainwater on site. Um, you know, I was raised on a, a dry farm up in southeastern Idaho, and a lot of the principles we did apply. And when I took my permaculture design course, it just started making sense. And the rainwater harvesting really, for uh, since we live in a desert and every drop is precious, we should be able to think, you know, ahead on how to design our landscapes to be able to capture and utilize that as beneficial purpose. And so the eight principles that Brad put in his book, and it starts out with, oh, it's no um, long and thoughtful observation. You know, it's no wonder that's where we start. This is also the same principle that we start with in permaculture, that long thoughtful observation. And so this is your opportunity to go out in your landscape, look, sit out, look at the traffic patterns. Where does the sun rise and where does it set throughout the year? How does the water flow through your yard currently? Is there any low spots or are there high spots? Is there problem areas? I love it when water harvesting can fix problems as well. And we should be thinking about those when we're creating our, our sustainable landscape designs on how to solve problems. And we also wanna think about how not to create problems. So we start with that long and thoughtful observation. If you've been in your home for at least a year, you've had a chance to see the seasonal changes. And yeah, I know it seems kind of odd to talk about seasonal changes. It seems like we got hot and cold, but there are changes. And to have that year to be able to see those patterns is beneficial. Multiple years is even and more. So uh, you know, creating that journal and writing down different patterns that you're seeing. Um, if you haven't been in your home for, for a year yet, well, you still can go forward. Just you, you won't have as much knowledge by building that long and thoughtful observation. So you're going to have to look at other patterns that were set by the previous homeowner. Like what was the traffic patterns? How did they travel or flow through their yard? And how do you want to flow through your own yard? So these are all things which uh, when you're sitting out thinking about your landscape design, give it some time, let things soak in, and always start at the top. So if we start at the top of the watershed, well, well, why does that make sense? Especially if we're talking about rainwater, if we're starting at the top of our watershed, well, we get to use gravity. And then gravity is gonna move that water down, down, down slope. So starting at the top and then slow spread and sinking that rainwater and thin our landscape. 
starting small and simple. This is definitely a good approach to take. Just by creating small little earthworks, getting water to move from one location to another location. It could be as simple as just going out um, with a, a shovel and a rake and moving some, some soil around and contouring and getting the water to, to move where you want it to. That's definitely a good, small and simple approach. Adding rain tanks, gray water systems, those are definitely good steps to take, but at the next level, and because they get more complicated, they become more active systems. So starting small and simple just by making small changes and, and same with your landscape design, making small changes. You wouldn't have to jump into it all at once. You can do it in sections. And so you could plant out a, one area and then plant out another, you know, take a few years to do it. You don't have to jump into it all at once. Or if you do, you know, starting out with that design is definitely going to be a key. And, I, and I, I'll say it probably a hundred more times tonight. Slow, spread, and sink that, that water in your landscape. That's important because, as I mentioned here in, in Arizona, it's perfectly legal to capture and utilize our rainwater on site. And so if we have water running off into the, the street, we just didn't get to use that as a beneficial purpose for our plants. So creating those, uh, oh, let me see if I can get my pointer to work here. All right, you should see my laser pointer now. So some terms and all that, uh, terminology that I'm gonna be using tonight when we're talking about uh, water harvesting and earthworks, which is, this is what you're looking at. This is a, a, an earthworks demonstration that you're seeing here, where down in the bottom where you have the wood chip mulch, this is the basin. That's that low lying area. Okay, so creating those basins, that's where water is going to be able to settle. Okay, so if you slowed it down and by through a swell, and that's what you're seeing right here, it's conveying the water. So in the basin, it sinks. In the swell, it's going to convey, so it's going to slowly spread it out into the landscape to the next basin. Okay. So the high spot here, this is a berm. So a lot of our landscapes, um, well, if you aren't, if you're on a pretty much a flat graded landscape, berms and basins um, are definitely some of the key features that you'll be creating in swells, but the berms are mainly from aesthetics. You're raising that soil up where if you have on slope, so you got a little bit of slope to your property, when you use a berm, it's actually going to create a basin behind it. Okay, and so when thinking about berms, berms can be aesthetics, Berms could be holding, you know, help holding water back into a basin, and berms can be set up to help convey water, you know, within swells. So you have a berm, a basin, the bottom here, and where the rock line is, that's a swell going down to the next basin. Berms and basins and swells. All right, so slow spread and sink, and that's how you do it, it's through earthworks. Ooh. One other thing I really love about this photo too is this tree. This tree's creating resources as well. And it's, you can tell it's starting to turn colors and those leaves are gonna to start to drop. And yeah, that's a resource. So that's just gonna be adding mulch to, the, to your project as well. If you could just let those leaves be, let those uh, leaves you know, collect within the basin area. Um, too, adding mulch is gonna help build and, and feed the soil and it works as a sponge. So that's all part of that integration side of uh, slowing and spreading and sinking that rainwater in your landscape. Okay, the overflow. Guarantee it, if you don't take it in consideration, Mother Nature already has the, the intention of where that overflow is going to be. So the lowest part on your earthworks, uh, so you got a berm, and that lowest part on the berm, well, that's where water is going to find its way out. Okay, so create that in your in your earthworks. Know where it's at. Rock line it. Give it some um, stabilization. You know, reduce erosion. But you also want to use it as a resource. Okay, this gets back to that slow spread and sinking our rainwater. We want to slowly travel it from one area to another to another, and gently just slowly using it as a resource. And so the final overflow would be to the stormwater system to the street. And so it should have gone through a nice journey and, and had a chance to settle in before it gets to that point. Living in organic ground cover. So 
Boy, uh, definitely uh, using organic mulch. I'm a big fan of that. It helps feed the soil, but covering the ground with ground cover, that's gonna help cool down the soil. It's gonna make for the plant's roots around it are gonna be happier. The, if we create that happy soil by using our different types of plants and our organic mulch, then we're gonna be creating happy plants. And because if you feed in the soil, then that soil is gonna have the nutrients and um, the things that it would need for those plants to be happy. And uh, if you maximize that living in organic ground cover, that's a step forward moving to that. Uh, it's also good to not leave a bare soil. It's always good to cover that soil because there again, mother nature has a plan for bare soil. She wants to cover it up and she may cover it up with what, uh, what we call weeds, but uh, it's definitely a, yeah, a plant that's going to, you know, not take much water. It's going to grow and it's going to cover that area. So we want to do our part and we want to cover that bare soil with some sort of uh, ground cover or organic material. Stacking functions. This is another permaculture principle. I love stacking functions. You can take this beyond just uh, think of your landscape design. You think about uh, every element that you put into your design should serve at least, at least two functions. Three or four or more would always be better. But if it only serves one function, well, that's got to be a pretty important element to deserve, you know, that space in my landscape. But also, too, when things, you know, you think about what you bring into your home or, you know, when you purchase things, how many uses or how many um, functions does that serve? And so, uh, but this example, thinking of a rain tank, okay? A rain tank, well, we know it it's going to help, uh, you know, it's going to capture water. So that's one thing. It's going to have water so we can release it and help water our plants. That's another. Uh, it's, you know, it's vertical. So we could put a, uh, like a trellis around it. We could screen it so it could be a, a trellis. It could um, be placed in a location that's going to help create a breezeway. You could place it in a location that's going to cast a shadow on the house at the right time of day. Okay, so think about all those stacking the functions. Um, another one too, which is a really easy one when thinking about stacking functions is a tree. So if I'm planting a tree in my design, knowing that yes, that tree is gonna serve more than just shade, right? That's usually what, oh, we want a tree because we want shade, but no, it's gonna help clean our air. It's gonna provide that wildlife habitat and, you know, go on and on about a tree. And well, too, if I plant 15 feet, you know, two trees 15 feet apart, I can hang my hammock between them. So, you know, stacking those functions. How many uses can you get out of each element you place into your design? And then, yeah, no wonder. It gets right back to thoughtful observation. It's that continual reassessing what you've done. So we end where we start. It's this continuous loop. Because if you don't get out and see the work that we've done, how do we know what's working? And the best time to see it is when, well, when it's, especially for your earthworks, it's when it's raining and uh, you have that chance to see that water flowing. Yes, that's working. Oop, nope, that's not quite working there. You can adjust it and make those changes. And the things that are working right, replicate them. The things aren't quite working right, you can change them, especially if you started small and simple. These are small and simple approaches to fix as well. But it's very important to, to continually reassess and uh, make sure that your project is still working the way that you originally designed it. Because as years go by, you're gonna, well, if you use an organic mulch, that's gonna deplete, you're gonna have to give more to that. How are your plants doing? Are your plants thriving? Are they just getting by? So, you know, having that continual reassessing is important because, well, if you don't, it, how are you gonna know what's causing any of the issues if you do have them, or how do you know what's working? So. Get out there, and the best time to do it, as I mentioned, when it's raining. Um, one of my instructors says, Ryan, you're not a water harvester until you're out there at 3 a.m. in the morning. And <laughs> I'm guilty. I've been out there with my flashlight looking. But uh, gosh, I hope we get some rain soon and for your projects and, and uh, in the day that you can go ahead and observe that. All right. So where do we start? Well, Always starting with long and thoughtful observation and then putting it onto a, a, a map, creating a drawing. And so making a map, 
lots of tools out there now on, online. And so uh, there's uh, Google Earth, Google Maps. These are all, you know, um, easy, free to use. You zoom in to your location. It might be a couple years out of date. So it's hard to, you know, do you know, you know how recent it is? You can see by down in the lower right hand corner, it will usually tell you the date of that photo or at least the year of it. Uh, but definitely good tools to use. Another tool in this one I, I personally like to use is the, the Maricopa County's assessor's map. And so they have a partial viewer. And uh, let me go ahead and see. So this is uh, the URL to get there. It's quite a long one. I typically just Google Maricopa County assessor's maps. And then the link's usually right there on the top. Um, let me, I'm going to stop sharing this. I want to go ahead and show you this tool real quick. I'm going to stop sharing this screen. And let me see if I can get my other screen shared here. Okay. All right. So you should be seeing on your uh, screen there, this is the Maricopa County's assessor's map. You can see here at the top of the URL. Okay. And I just started zooming in. This is, uh, I was just picking a spot. This is a Glendale area. <laughs> and if this is your home, I, I'm, <laughs> it's just pure chance. I uh, just wanted to select something to give an example here. Let me see if I can get this to move where I want it to. Okay. Here we go. All right. So when you're on the tool or in the assessor's map, there's uh, base maps. And the base maps, what I like about it is I got the 2020 base map selected here, but we can also go and see history. So there's uh, 2019, 2018. And so you can see history of your yard too. It goes back, it looks like uh, 2012 is one of the dates here. You, um, might have to zoom out to see uh, the different resolution. But that's really handy about this tool too, especially if you're new to your home, then this gives you a little bit of history just through the assessor's map. The other tools that I like is that you can be able to um, go back to the 2020 here. Okay, just gonna leave it paused on that for a moment. And so you can turn off some of the things that are kind of noisy there. So like the annotations, we can turn that off. The street labels, the parcel number, um, and the selectable layers, we can turn that off. Okay. Or, or we can leave it on either way. But what we get is this uh, image of the house. Okay. We have other tools. We have a measuring tool. The measuring tool is handy so that way you can Outline your area. You can do a square foot area. You can just measure lengths. You can you know, use that tool to your advantage. But really, just the handiest thing about this is it gives you a reference scale right here at the bottom. That little line is 20 feet is what it's showing. Okay. So if I was going to take a screen grab of this, I would include that, that little marker there along with the image. And so that way, you can use that as a reference. And so your scale is right there. So that little uh, mark is 20 feet. So you can use your ruler. You measure that 20, that line here for that 20 foot. Okay. And you can use your, uh, your ruler from that point to just use it as a scale. So drawing the scale is, is always a good thing to do, especially if you're, um, you know, beyond the bubble stage or you're just, you know, you're getting ready to, to start marking things down and it's, um, uh, it's good to do it to scale, but don't be surprised when you actually get out to the landscape that things aren't quite lining up exactly what you, you did. Um, that's very typical, you know, being off six inches, that's not a problem within landscaping unless you're, you know, you're building a structure or something like that. Okay. All right, so Maricopa County's assessor's map, that's a good tool to use. Go ahead and um, stop screen sharing this. Pull up the other presentation. Okay. So parcel viewer is, uh, and if you go to this website too, there's a lot of viewers on there. There's also one down at the very bottom to keep scrolling down on this uh, website for this maricopa.gov. You, you scroll down and there's the Maricopa County's um, uh, flood control districts, the rainfall data. 
that is really handy to look because a lot of times their gauges so their gauges are throughout the valley through maricopa county find a gauge that's close to you and then look at the history of that uh, gauge sometimes it's 26 plus years of history good way to start seeing rain patterns and see how um uh, how much rainfall you're getting in your area because it does vary through the valley um, there's some areas that may only get you know four or five inches in one in that year same years other places might get eight inches so it, it definitely varies so good tools to use but pen and paper you can't beat it it's a good uh, simple way of just getting your drawing down on a sheet of paper I always like to start out with the border, okay? What's the property lines? And so if, if I draw my property lines first, and I, if I draw it to scale, okay, now I'm setting the parameters on that sheet of paper and I can draw everything else in it. Um, when talking about scale, I should reference a couple of tools here. There's a engineering scale, an architectural scale. These are basically just rulers that already got a defined scale for you. If, um, if you just have a regular old ruler, you can use that. You just say, well, a quarter inch equals a foot or one inch equals 10 feet. You, you, you call out the scale. Uh, if you have grid paper, you could do the same. You know, one little square is a foot or maybe one square is 10 feet, whatever your scale be. You know, you write that down, but start with those property lines. Okay, so draw those property lines to scale and then draw where your house is. Um, Another way too, you could take that screen grab of the assessor's map or a Google map and then outline and draw over on top of that. So that's one way of doing it. Okay. And then start getting into detail. So where does the water flow? Okay, where's the water flowing? Start in, well, well, one of the principles, where do we start? Principle number two, we always start at the top. So same within your design. You're gonna start at the top of your roof and you're gonna work your way down, okay? So draw in your roof. So for example, this is showing the, the, the ridge line. So that's the peak of the roof, okay? This is a little patio overhang here, okay? Notice these arrows in the direction that they're pointing, okay? So the arrows are pointing going this direction, arrows are pointing going to the opposite direction. And then in this particular site, there's gutters. And that's what you're seeing here with the dashed lines showing gutters and the downspout. That's that little round with an arrow right there. So your water flow in this particular uh, scenario, you have basically um, a watershed going to the, the, the right and a watershed going to the left. So watershed going to the east, watershed going to the west, and then there's uh, a little bit of some watershed going to the north. But or I'm sorry, to the south. But all that is wrapped up into one big watershed. So you have sub watersheds that are making up one watershed. And I should step back for a moment and just say, you know, a watershed is an area that drains to a common point. Okay, so it's an area that drains to a common point. So for example, if your house was graded, you know, the home was graded in the property to the, to the street, so all the um, water will flow to the street. Okay, so your street side, it's, it's one direction. That's, that's one watershed. But if it's split and you have half of the water going to the alley and, ha and let's say the backyard to the alley and the front yard to the street, then you basically got two watersheds. You got your backyard watershed and your front yard watershed. Okay. And in this scenario, the gutters and the downspouts is pulling everything to the, the more the front yard watershed. So then drawn in, where is those, uh, where's the pooling areas? Okay, that, where's those low spots? This was uh, part of your long and thoughtful observation that you had a chance to go out where it rains and you're like, oh, that's the spot where it's a low spot, it already pools there. That could be your first basin. And you could just go ahead and accent it, make it a little bit larger if need to be, you know, work with that. Or if it's a problem, then you know that's where you need to build up or you need to redirect water, okay? And so then it's showing water. Notice the downspout here that's going to the driveway. Oh, we got to fix that. And then it's going around here and it's going to the pool. 
you know, into a pulling area. Okay, maybe that's good. Maybe that could be another basin. And then notice how the water's flowing. Water's flowing to the east, both in the alley and in the street. Okay, so mark down all the flow, uh, water flows through your, your, starting from the top of the roof, going through your yard. So you're gonna need to know where's the high spot and where's the low spot. You know, so for example, if they split this, um, you know, showing water kind of moving this way. So if your high spot is in the back area and your low spot is at the street, then that tells me everything's gonna to drain towards the street. However, in your scenario, you may have a high spot at midway, okay? So there could be a high spot where, like I was mentioning earlier, the backyard drains to the alley and the front yard drains to the street, okay? So a good way to figure out how to, you know, what the level is, is using a water level, also known as a bunya. And, uh, or you can use a site level, a laser level, but knowing what you have for high spots and low spots is, is always a beneficial, uh, so that way you can add it to your drawing. And then what other water sources do you have? And where's your gray water sources? So we know our rainwater, where it's flowing, but your gray water, for example, your laundry water is a good um, resource to be able to utilize into the landscape with the right types of soaps. Uh, your shower water, uh, bathtub water, um, you know, the kitchen sink, that's kind of a dark gray area. It's um, only if you're using a kitchen resource drain and, and that's uh, applicable in certain areas. Um, but definitely that laundry machine, that's typically the easiest gray water re, uh, resource that you can get out to the landscape, gray, gray water source. So um, mark those on your, your drawing and where they're at. Are they accessible? You know, so for example, is your gray water, you know, from your laundry machine, this is a setup of a laundry to landscape, okay? And uh, the laundry machine, you know, here's the hose for the laundry machine. But this pipe going out to the, the wall here, there's your auto vent, so that way the water won't just keep siphoning out. But notice it's right next to a wall. That's the key, is how to get the gray water out the house. And so typically that's, that's our first uh, hurdle, is that uh, the laundry machine, you know, the laundry room is right in the middle of the house. We got hallways or maybe we got a garage to get through. So that's typically the biggest challenge, however, you know, you can get creative. For example, here's this uh, a vent pipe. It's in the way, but using some uh, creative uh, plumbing techniques to move around that pipe, okay? And then getting the water out the, from the wall. So you're having to drill a hole through the wall, okay? So, but then once you get it out into the yard, you can get creative with it. It's just uh, where, where the gray water hose is coming up and then it just drains down. So it can be aesthetics as well. Storm water, especially those opportunities where there's already a, you know, a, a gap in the curb to where water's flowing into the landscape if it just was brought down a little bit. And this is also called um, green infrastructure, low impact development. These are um, good uh, applications of collecting storm water and using it as a beneficial purpose. And so Green infrastructure is those features. These are you know, bioretention basins, but that mulch is serving a purpose. That mulch is helping and the plants are gonna help take up that pollution or they're gonna sequester. So uh, taking that opportunity uh, to, um, if there's already water coming into an area and you can just accent that, um, keeping it within the right of way, but definitely uh, don't go out and start cutting curbs and drilling hole through curbs without the city's approval. So that's uh, something that, um, you know, just uh, eventually I, I see that uh, in the future, these are gonna be more things that uh, are gonna be more applicable. And, uh, but for now, there's not a permitting process here in the Maricopa County for doing these type of practices. They're basically very site specific. However, keep those uh, in mind, those opportunities, because if you can imagine just streets lined with trees that are getting fed with stormwater, Okay. So, using it as a beneficial resource. All right. So when you get all this information, you know, you're going to be putting it on your drawing. So a good way to, to start marking on your drawing is in different colors. Um, creating multiple sheets is another way. It's just uh, like using a CAD program, a, a computer drafting design program, like AutoCAD or SketchUp. 
those programs are going to use layers. And so you'd create a layer for your, your property outline. You'd create a layer for the house. You'd create a layer for the pathways and a layer for the basins and things like that. A, a layer for your utilities. But uh, when just drawn on, on a single sheet of paper using various, you know, uh, multiple colors is a good way. So for example, in gray, you're seeing all the different utilities. And in brown, you're seeing the pathways, the, the noisy, um, thinking about those uh, different sectors or different factors, uh, the view, the noise, the privacy. So for example, when I mentioned views, is that a view of a beautiful area out the window you don't want to block? Or is it um, the, maybe the neighbor's security light that shines right into your window? So that helps to, uh, to know, do you plant a tree or a shrub in that area to help block that, that view um, or block that noise? Or are you wanting it to open up? So don't plant a tree there or, or something that's gonna cover that view. And then using plants to help block out noise and add privacy, that's a great use of plants because they're also providing how many more functions, right? And so uh, mark down those existing trees and shrubs. This is important. You're gonna to wanna to mark down everything that you have on site that you're wanting to keep, okay? Because that's where they're at. You're gonna start building around them. And uh, I consider trees as like the foundation plants that you're, you're building around. So if you have nothing in your yard, the first thing that I always start with is putting where I want the trees. And then I start designing around that. But if you have existing trees, you're gonna be working within those, uh, working your design within those existing trees because those existing trees are gonna have existing roots. And those roots are gonna be, you know, anywhere from surface down to three feet or lower, but they're gonna be spread out at least, at least the canopy um, width or 30 plus percent more out. Okay, so the roots are gonna be out there. And so when we're digging, we don't, we don't wanna dig into too many roots, especially uh, the rule of thumb is you don't wanna cut into to roots that are larger than your thumb. And if you're going to have to do that, I would definitely consult with an arborist, let them know what you're wanting to do and see if that's even going to be safe and healthy for the tree. So um, that also depends on how deep when you dig your basins is, you know, you've got it specced out to where I want to dig a, a 12 inch basin to capture two inches of rain, but you may only be able to dig four or five inches because of the roots. Okay. So marking where those are at using different colors. I want to just pause for a minute on utilities because utilities is, uh, well, oh boy, utilities can have a big effect on your, your design because, well, for example, um, if you want to plant a tree, it's the perfect location. It's going to block uh, the sun from beating down on the west side of my house, but I got a, I got a water line that runs right through it or a sewer line or a gas line. So the first call that you should make when, uh, before you do any digging or, or any planting, and then too, when think about design, you can you know, get a design review to know where your utilities are, but call Arizona 811. That's a, uh, an organization where they're gonna come out and they're gonna mark all the public utilities, okay? So they're gonna mark all the public utilities that are on your property, but they're not gonna mark the private utilities. So for example, when I, when I say that, so you know, when I'm looking at the colors here, these are the colors that you're gonna see painted out uh, and they represent the different type of utilities under the ground or above ground, okay? So red, electric, that could be above ground lines and or it could be below ground lines. But the connection point is at the house typically, and that's going to be your electric uh, meter box. Okay, so that's the utilities connection point. So they'll mark a, a red line if it's underground. They'll mark a red line up towards your house. They won't. They're not going to mark on your house up to the electrical box, but that's going to mark the ground. If it's uh, above ground, they're going to mark it as a no conflict. But it's still a conflict, you, not for digging, but you don't want to plant a tree or something right below a big, huge power line. Um, you got to think of safety. So uh, definitely got to remember to look up. Yellow, yellow stands for, for gas. And where's the gas meter? So the, the utilities connection point, that gas meter is typically right up by the house. 
So they'll mark a yellow line from wherever it is from the street or the alley. They're going to mark that yellow line up to the to that uh, gas meter. Okay. Um, same with communications. That's your uh, CenturyLink, Cox Communication. It's going to be an orange line underground, or they're going to mark it above, right? And it's going to be going to where the the connection point. And that's that box on the house. All right. So sewer. Where's the connection point at the sewer? So the connection point is considered to be out somewhere on the main sewer line. That's either going to be in the alley or in the street. And so they'll mark a green line, you know, mark that area, probably like the manhole or mark something on the street, but they don't mark all the way up to your house. And that's the same with the water line. Okay, the water line, the, the connection point is the water meter. So the utility will mark, you know, the Arizona blue stake will mark up to the meter, but not from the meter to the house. That's a private utility. So for your sewer line and your water line being private utilities, they're not going to get marked by Arizona 811. So you're going to have to figure out where they're at. You could, so the, the water line is typically going to be about 18 inches to two feet deep, should be. And you could say, well, here's the water meter. And then you look at your house, uh, the front of the house, and you see where the hose bib and the main shutoff valve is for your, for your house. Typically, you know, you think, well, it's a straight line from this meter to there. Well, I can tell you personally, don't make that mistake because it, it, it could come off that meter and go one direction and then back. And so you could dig um, what we call potholing. So dig down and try to find it, you know, digging real gently, not using any heavy equipment. Um, but the sewer line, you might be digging three to five feet. So that, that doesn't seem feasible. A private utility locator can help locate those for you. Okay. A uh, private utility locator is going to come out and they can mark uh, any of your private utility lines, um, but a plumber. So thinking of stacking functions, if you need to have a plumber to come out for any plumbing reason, you can ask to see if they got the equipment to be able to scope and see where your sewer line runs and if they can find your water line and they can mark it for you. And then you're going to add that to your drawing. Okay, so you don't want to have to keep um, hiring a private locator to come out and mark those for you. Now, every time you dig, you should call Arizona 811 just to make sure that no public utility ended up getting you know, moved or um, where uh, they might install something you weren't aware of. But uh, definitely always call Arizona 811 before you dig and then add those to your drawing. Another one I wanted to highlight on here real quick because it's just such a huge um, sector, or also known as factor. Uh, I, I know I mentioned sector and factor. I should explain a little bit. So these are just terminologies for those wild energies that flow through your property. Okay. And so those wild energies, you want to be able to harness them and utilize them for a benefit. And the sun, <laughs> wow, yeah, we got a lot of sun here in the, in the desert. And so knowing where it rises and where it sets throughout the year is very important. So uh, I know I, I, I love the question to ask, uh, especially when I'm out doing tailing events, uh, is asking the, you know, the public, where does the sun rise and where does it set? And you know, a lot of times I'll get, I'll get that kind of ponder look and yep, I get east and I get west and that's good. Then I like to ask, how many days out of the year does that happen? Well, <laughs> 365 is usually the answer, but it's only, you know, right around two days. And that's on our equinox when that sun rises pretty much due east and it sets pretty much due west. Okay. The rest of the time of the year, because the earth is moving around the sun, that sun is going to come up in different locations. And so the big one to note here is when we're celebrating our summer solstice on June 21st, that's when the sun's going to come up the far north east. Yep, it's going to rise in the northeast. And then at noon, it's going to be really high in the southern sky, about 78 degrees. And then it sets in the northwest. Okay, so that's on June 21st, summer solstice, rises in the northeast, sets in the northwest, and it's really high in the southern sky. So those are our real long days and very short shadows. The wintertime is the complete opposite. 
The sun rises in the southeast, sets in the southwest, and it's really low in the southern sky, about 33 degrees. So it's the complete opposite. It's those really short days and long shadows. So here in the Phoenix area, and December 21st, when we're celebrating our winter solstice, that's when the sun comes up in the southeast, sets in the southwest, real low in the sky. At noon, a shadow is going to get casted one and a half times the height of the object. So if the height of the object is 20 feet, then the shadow is going to get casted 30 feet. Okay, one and a half times the height of the object. So when thinking about that in your design for your south side of your yard, think about where that sun is going to rise and set. And then are you creating um, shade in the winter time when you don't want it? Okay, because that winter sun, we want it to help warm up our homes. We want it to help, you know, so we don't have to, you know, raise up our, our heating bills. We want that warm sun to help do that for us in the winter time. In the summertime, we want shade as much as we can to help cool our home down, okay? But when you're planting on the south side, for example, if I plant this big, huge um, evergreen tree right on the south side of my house, well, at noon, it might be casting a shadow all the way over my roof, okay? And plus, you know, when thinking about solar, uh, typically solar panels are gonna be on the south. I'm seeing them more on the east and west as well, but we don't wanna block the sun from, uh, from your solar panels too. So south side, you definitely want to be thinking about trees that drop their leaves or you're placing them further away that the shadow's not going to get casted um, on the things that you don't want to be casted during this, the winter time. Like uh, maybe your nice seating area where you want to enjoy in the, the cooler mornings of winter and not be too cold. You want that warm winter sun. So things to think about when you're creating your design is how that sun moves through, you know, well, how does the shadow patterns, I should say, uh, move throughout your yard throughout the year. And those shadow patterns, you can mark them on your drawing. You know, go out and take some photos. This is a good, you know, your long thoughtful observation, taking photos of those shadow patterns at eight, noon, and four, um, or maybe do it, go out at nine, one, and five. But uh, keeping those, so especially if you're starting to plant, your shadow patterns are going to change. So if you plant a new tree, your shadow pattern is going to um, uh, not be the same Today is it's going to be 10, 15 plus years from now. Okay. Think of your sun angles. So you just keep adding that to your drawing. For example, now we're going to sh start showing where, where are the plants? Where are we going to be putting new trees? Um, where, you know, what do you want to keep? What do you want to change? You know, I, I want to start putting in basins. I want to start capturing water. So you're going to start marking those down where you want that to be. Um, you know, I got this super hot area down here. So I know, wow, I, I need a tree. Okay, so that a good tree would be here. Um, I know that this water is running down to the driveway. So a basin here would be good. So that would be good ideas. So start thinking about what you want to add. What do you want to, to change up? What do you want to take out? This, uh, is the high water use plants, are they near your water source? Okay, or are they way out to the perimeter wall? And it's hard to get your uh, resources out there. If, you know, so thinking about creating that oasis, where's your water sources and those uh, typically around your house? Well, that could be your higher water use and then it goes out to the lower water use plants. That's one way to think about it as well. Uh, do you have any pooling near the foundations? As I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a good reason to fix problems with water harvesting, not make problems. So if you got pooling, how to get that water to move out? You could use um, downspouts and then have a pipe underground that pops up into a basin, okay, getting that water further away from your foundation. Emphasizing on pathways. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, trees are like my foundation when I start in, starting to create my designs. I start where the trees, where are the best location for my trees? And then pathways is usually what I start with next. What are my traffic patterns? How do I flow throughout my yard? Because once I start getting my pathways in, then typically I start seeing where my basins are going to go and uh, where are my swells and how am I going to convey that water around? So those hot areas, definitely addressing those with shade trees. 
and they don't have to be this big, huge, water thriving shade tree. They could be our native shade trees that grow really well here in, in our environment. And once it gets established, would require just very minimal supplemental water or none at all if we're getting our rains and we planted the rain. So we plant the water for the plants. So do you need a rain tank? Well, you know, that's a great question. The answer is, it depends. You may not need to put a rain tank in if you have all native plants that are, you know, that thrive in the desert on very minimal water, especially if you planted the rainwater for them. So doing your earthworks. So when the water runs off your roof, it goes out and gives those plants a little bit more water than what would just fall right on the place. So if, if that's the scenario and you're not using any water between storms, then a rain tank is not necessary. But if you are using water in between storms, then a rain tank does make sense because in that perfect scenario, you'd be going to your rainwater before you'd go to the potable water. Actually, rain, rainwater, gray water, and then potable water is your third source. If you're doing your water budget and you're planting within your water budget with what would just survive on rainfall alone, and then thinking about how you can collect and use your rainwater or your gray water to help supplement them, that's all going to help with water conservation. And so if we, uh, the less that we go to that tap and turn on and use that potable water, then the more energy that we're conserving and the more water we're conserving. So a uh, tank is definitely, it, it varies. Uh, do you have any privacy, you know, a view? You know, that's, uh, tanks can be used for that. They can help block and, and create more privacy. They can help you know, block that view. But there again, if, if you don't need a tank, it doesn't make sense. There's an expense to it. But if you are watering plants in between storms, think about a rain tank. Gray water potential. You know, it's definitely, uh, for example, a laundry system is typically the easiest to plumb out to the landscape. So that is usually, you know, might be a daily or weekly source of water. So that's a good to use. If you have a lot of high water use plants, good time to start thinking about how you may start limiting some of those high water use plants and replacing them with low water use plants, low water use native plants that do very well here in the desert. Okay, so take an inventory about do you need a tank? Well, if, if you could use your gray water or if you could change your landscaping, um, if, if simply if your water budget doesn't require you to have a tank, then I wouldn't put one in. All right, so where to add new plants? Always consider the mature size. It, you, you're doing a mistake if you say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's this, this only little small little tree. Um, you know, when I bought it, it was only this big around. Well, but that tree may grow to be a 30 foot canopy. So you have to plan for that size, okay? So plan for that size and draw on your plan at that size. So that way you're getting, you know, in the, the reality of what that tree area is gonna cover and where is the shadow gonna get casted. So in this, uh, in the sketch here, the dark green is the existing trees. The light green is where the new trees are gonna get added. Okay, just here again, using colors to help communicate the, uh, you know, your ideas and your thoughts and, uh, and get them on paper. So that way, if you're showing it to other people, they can look at this and say, oh, I see what you got. Yep, there's a tree. I see a basin here. That basin is gonna overflow to the next basin. This basin overflows to the next one. Oh, look, there's our downspout that was just draining into the driveway. Now it's going to a basin first. It's helping to support this walnut. And then it's going down into another basin, into another uh, low water use tree. Okay. And then we got another little basin. Here's a pathway. More basins slowly spreading and seeking that rainwater throughout the site. And then too, if you decide to add gray water, that's perfect. You know where to put it. It out, goes out to your basins. If you decide to add a rain tank, perfect. The overflow goes to your basins. Okay, so that's why starting small and simple with your earthworks is always a good approach. Okay, um, your water supplies. 
where are you going to get water from? Okay, getting back to you got your rainwater. You, you might have a rain tank, you might have your gray water source, but where's the tap? You still want to know where the tap is? Are you going to be using an irrigation system? How easy is it going to be to plumb an irrigation system? Do you have electricity to where you want to put the controller? Are you going to need a battery operated controller? Okay, so think about your water supply. The shade, do you got the right amount of shade? Is it where you need it at the right time of year? Okay, so be thinking about your solar, um, how those uh, seasonal sun patterns change and where your shade and where you want it to be. And if you can get shade casted on your walls, windows, and doors, especially on the west side, east side, and then the south side, and, and your north side's good too, but that west side is just really the hot side. So you wanna make sure that you, you get that, uh, you know, trees and shade. If you don't have a space for a tree to help cast a shadow onto the side, think about trellises or big shrubs to get shadow casting onto that wall, windows and doors. All right, aesthetics. Definitely creating a design with our beautiful low water use desert plants. Um, one that, that I, I really like too is like the desert willow tree. The desert willow tree is gonna want a little bit more water than say a, our native velvet mesquite which is a, a wonderful tree as well. But the, the desert willow, that's a good south side tree. So if I'm planting on the south side of my house, that's a good tree to plant because it's gonna drop all its leaves in the wintertime. It's a full deciduous tree. It's gonna, uh, the, the flowers on it's gonna have a, a sweet aroma to it. It's gonna attract the pollinators, especially if you've um, got a seeding area, that would be a, a good spot. To, to plant it next to as well. Um, but our native velvet mesquites, our ironwoods, our palo verde trees, these are all producing edible food. So the mesquite pods, we can harvest the ironwood, we can harvest the, the pods and the flowers that, same with the, the palo verde tree. So what more functions can each element serve and what do you want them for? So it's not just about aesthetics, but it's about the integrated design and the function of them. And the aesthetics is just the benefit that we get as well. So this is uh, an example of um, doing the earthworks here. You're seeing the, the berm on the outside, okay? You have a basin, this is the lower area, and the rock lines are to help stabilize it. It's creating different planting zones, okay? So for example, here's just a little basin area next to the drip line of the tree, of this uh, citrus tree. This is a good area, okay? You see there's a little uh, downspout uh, drain right here. That's that little white thing. This would be a good location to put your gray water as well, okay? So just little basins, they don't have to be big. They could just be fitting within the tree, but in the right spot to where the tree at the drip line. Planting shelves, okay, rock lining areas that are going to be steep. So if it's steeper than a um, what's called a three to one. So if, if you go out three units and down one unit, okay, that's a three to one. If it's steeper than that, say a two to one. So out two units, down one unit, or out one unit and down one unit, that's going to be pretty steep. And so you might have to to line that side of the berm, okay, or line the side of the basin with some rocks. This is a, a rip wrap, that's angular shaped rock that really locks in together, okay. But the tree is not in the, in the bottom of the basin. It's a little bit high. So you'll see the downspout coming down and then it comes out and there's that pop-up, okay. So it's moving the water away from the house getting it out into the, into the basin area. And then these basins are connected with a swell. Again, this is another really good example of planting shelves, okay? And using rock work to help hold that steep bank. Okay, so using that rock work, we got the wood chip mulch in the bottom of the basin, plants that like water and could be uh, inundated with water for, for a little bit during a storm, grasses. Grasses do really well. But your water-loving plants could be in the bottom of the basin. Um, but the plants that like to be a little dry, 
They don't want to be inundated with water um, and they don't require much water. Those should be up a little bit higher and not in your bottom of the basin. So creating planting shells is good. And then two, you know, see in the tree, it's outside the basin. And then it, the roots of the tree is gonna grow out, you know, past the canopy. And so it's gonna utilize all this water here too. So keep in mind, um, when, when doing a basin, you don't just uh, dig a, you know, a hole about five feet in diameter and you just put the tree right in the center of it. You want the tree a little bit higher. And then if in the perfect scenario, you're creating those earthworks around where the drip line is going to be. Pathways. So with those uh, pathways, as I mentioned earlier, uh, trees and pathways for me just kind of help start you know, it's, it starts setting the design. And uh, pathways, I love adding pathways because that's the flow. Uh, how do you get throughout your yard? Especially if they can be, con you know, continuous areas, you know, no dead ends where uh, you could just keep walking and flowing and go throughout your yard. But having those raised pathways will create basins on the sides of them. And then think of those spaces for the continual, you know, reassessing your work. Places where you can sit and enjoy. Get the, the shade in the summertime, the nice winter sun to help warm you up in, in the wintertime. I think I said that the opposite. Shade in the summertime, warm winter sun in the wintertime. Okay, but creating those spaces. It, you should be part of your landscape and, and your design. So thinking about it, because if you go in, um, you know, outside to, to enjoy the, your, your yard and uh, the, the work that you're putting in to create your, your beautiful sustainable landscape design, you should be having a space that you could sit and enjoy it. All right, so lots of information, but uh, definitely really curious about what your ideas are and, and what your questions are. Hey, Joanne, do we right, have any Brian. That's awesome. So we've got some questions. Um, you know, people are really interested in gray water, um, rainwater harvesting. So let's go through some of the, the first questions that I got. Um, all right. Well, one person, let me back up. One person said that they have a pool um, and they said, can this be sustainable? Ryan, I'll tell you what I um, mentioned. And I said, um, Let's see, you know, I'm gonna try and pull up my face here, but let me read the question first and then I'll tell you uh, how I responded. So I have a pool, can this be sustainable? I wrote, yeah, there's things that you can do. Um, you can uh, use a pool cover, solar pool heater for the winter, manage chemicals for your water quality, reuse pool water in the landscape if you have salt tolerant plants. Um, I also have friends that converted their diving pool into a koi pond. So Ryan, do you work with many properties that have pools and what, what do you advise? Gosh, that's a great question, Joanne. And, and all the information that you provided, if, if you're gonna keep that pool, that's exactly what I would suggest as well. If you're interested in, in taking the pool out or changing it, and I love the koi pond idea. Um, also too, of making it you know, into a, a nature pond that uh, you have uh, basically the plants that are helping to, to clean the water. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to work on one of those kind of projects. I've only read about them and, and uh, you know, seen photos, but definitely a good way of, of utilizing it. And it's important too, if you're, you're putting in the investment into a pool is that you go out and enjoy it. And, uh, but if you're looking to take out the pool um, or just not fill it full of water, there's, um, you know, you might be able to make a deck over the pool. So it's now your outside seating area. It's, it's now a deck. Um, you could convert that pool into a water, uh, rainwater collection system. Uh, so there's definitely, a, or you can also, um, you can dig out or take the pool out, basically break it down and, and fill it in and then have nice planting areas. So uh, definitely though, if you're gonna keep the pool, those are awesome ideas, Joanne. Very good, yeah. Um, there's so much and, and you know, there's just a lot of really creative people out there doing, um, you know, stuff with a pool and aquaponics and having fish and then using the fish waste to 
um, make their gardens even more robust. And so, yeah, there's just a lot of uh, really creative people out there. And if, the, if it's something that you're interested in, there's probably a Facebook group, there's probably a website. Um, so follow, you know, those, those passions of yours. Um, but how cool that someone was asking, you know, what can they do to make their pool more sustainable? And, you know, in water conservation, we're not against pools. Um, it's really just making your pool as efficient as possible. And, and another thing I don't think we mentioned, Ryan, was just checking for leaks. Um, there's a really simple pool test that you can do. It's called a bucket test. You put your bucket on one of the steps, you fill it with water so that it's at the same level as the pool, and then you just let it sit there for a day or two. And if the uh, level has dropped in the bucket, you probably have a leak. So, um, or excuse me, if the, did I say that backwards? If the water level is different in the bucket than it is the pool, you probably have a leak. Um, so yeah, something as simple as a bucket test. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the pool goes the lower than the bucket. Yeah, because <laughs> the, the evaporation um, should be similar, you know, within the pool and the bucket. But yeah, if you, if you come out and the, the pool is lower than the bucket, then there might be a leak somewhere in the pool or could even be the pool equipment, the, you know, that recycles could be a leak in the pipe somewhere. And so also, too, it makes me think of the autofills, uh, which is very convenient to have a pool autofill but make sure that it's not continually running. Um, calcium gets built up, that valve won't want to close. Um, or, you know, too, you know, the PVC pipe, you know, it gets old, sometimes it will break. There could be leaks between the shutoff valves to the, the, to the float. So definitely the good thing, um, a good way to be sustainable with the pool is to make sure that you're just um, watching to make that water's not, you know, over evaporating, so having a pool cover, that you're not losing it to leaks or you know an autofill kind of scenario. Awesome. Um, well, Ryan, we had a question about um, converting grass to zero escape, and I'm going to take a stab at this. So, uh, first of all, congratulations. You know, grass. Um, Again, you know, when water conservation, we're not against grass. I personally have about 400 square feet of grass in my backyard. Um, I have a sulcata tortoise. Her name is Earth, and um, that is her primary source for her diet. She eats grass. Um, but, you know, doing that conversion, it, it's a lot of work. Uh, I'm not trying to talk you out of it, but do know that a lot of the cities have landscape rebates. So if you take out your grass, convert it to desert landscape, um, contact your local water provider to see if they have a rebate. So Glendale has a rebate if you are a Glendale water customer. Most of the cities do except for Phoenix. Um, so definitely check that out because you could get money for doing that. Also get a good kill on the grass. That's really important. You don't want to you know, not do that step thoroughly and then wind up having grass grow through your organic mulch, which could be like wood chips or your inorganic mulch, which would be like gravel. So however you decide to kill the grass, you know, try and do it in a way that's as sustainable as possible. Um, I have included a link from the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension on some steps or ways to eradicate that Bermuda grass. This particular person was asking about um, fabric or plastic. I don't like either. That's my personal opinion. Ask others in the industry because if you're using that to suppress the grass, that's not gonna work. If you're using that fabric or the plastic to suppress weeds, that's not gonna work. Weed seeds are tenacious. They will grow on top of the plastic. They will grow on top of the fabric and you're gonna have weeds. Um, also, what happens is that plastic erodes over the time, the fabric erodes over the time, sometimes it makes its way to the surface and it just doesn't look good. And then you wind up having to rip it and then you're pulling the gravel and it's a mess. Um, also, when you have plastic, it's creating kind of like an anoxic environment, so without oxygen, and you're just kind of killing the soil ecology. And that's not really good either. So I don't recommend either. Ryan, do you recommend any sort of fabric uh, or plastic? No, not personally. I, I echo the same, Joanne, definitely. With, especially with uh, <laughs> all the dust that we get, you know, and it just builds up on top of that. And like you said, the, the weed seeds, will they'll germinate just right on top of it. And the uh, thing when I think about when removing grass is um, you just be very careful of any existing trees. And so if, if the grass is growing around the trees, you know, when digging it out, um, but then also too, keep in mind that those, those trees have been living in that grass environment. And now you're taking that away from them. 
Okay, so they might have been uh, supported with a little extra water from all the, you know, from irrigating the grass. So you're going to really want to nurse those trees a bit and get them, you know, weaned off of that environment into their new zero escape environment. So you may have to water them a little bit more, uh, make sure that you're caring for them. And, uh, and two, if you're uh, replacing them with artificial turf, um, I get very sensitive to the trees because uh, if you're going to cover it with artificial turf, you know, taking out um, regular turf and putting artificial in, um, just very concerned about the tree to be able to breathe, to be able to get the water that it needs. So um, definitely if any existing trees, be very cautious and uh, give them some love afterwards. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I, you know, and I agree with you with the artificial turf. It gets hot. And so um, we had a, 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 a attendee who asked about artificial turf, and I'm not going to answer this via typing. I'm going to answer it um, orally. So do your research on artificial turf. Um, I always have to temper myself because, you know, when you have the landscape kind of um, aesthetic, there's the wild to the very highly like English garden. I am very much on the wild side, you know, and I know that I'm in the minority. Not everybody likes kind of like a wild natural aesthetic. Um, the artificial turf, again, do your research. There's pros, there's cons. Um, one reason why I don't like it is because it does, in, it does get really, really hot. Um, also, it's not organic. It's not a natural material. And someday it is going to go into a landfill. Um, is it green? Does it look cheery? It does. Maybe you can find an alternative plant um, that kind of gives you that same aesthetic, a ground cover. Um, but do your research because it is an investment. And ultimately, I always tell people, get the landscape that you want. If you want artificial turf, just because I don't like it doesn't mean that you can't get it. I'm not going to live with you. Um, so, you know, get the landscape that you want. You know, life is short. That's all I'm going to say, but do your research. So, Ryan, um, we were getting a lot of questions. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one more thing to add to that, just one thing about is if you're taking out the grass, I hope you're also going to be put in a tree if you don't have one, because you want to shade, because um, you're taking away a kind of a cooler environment with the grass. Um, but if you're taking it out, there should be a shade tree, something that's going to cast a shadow over if you could put in a rock mulch or something down, because we don't want to create more heat by taking out the grass. Absolutely. With this record-breaking hot summer, it, if anything that this summer has done to me, it has made me want to plant more trees. So at the city of Glendale, I was walking with my coworker an hour before this class tonight, mapping out some trees in front of the Glendale Main Library that we want to plant in early December. So now's the time. And yes, we live in a desert and 300 plus days of sunshine, plant more trees. Um, Ryan, we were getting a lot of questions about rainwater and gray water. So let me start off first with rainwater. Um, do you have any good sources for tanks for people that do want to have tanks or cisterns? Yeah, good sources for tanks. So um, that's a good question. I, I just personally know of one, it's called Tank and Barrel. They're out in Apache Junction. Um, but there's, I, I was driving up the Flagstaff last week and there's a place off the, around New River. And I saw there's some, some big tanks out there as well. Um, but also, you know, Ewing Irrigation, I know, might be able to get tanks. Um, Ace Hardware, some of those. Um, Ace Hardware's uh, could get tanks. So, you know, shop around. Um, I, you know, you can even order them online. But uh, as far as locally driving out to one, you know, if you come from Glendale, it might be um, going to New River. But uh, Tank and Barrel, it's got a lot of different uh, tanks out there to choose from, too. Yeah, I always tell people, you know, part of sustainability is also kind of like getting to know your neighbors. So about 10 years ago, um, my, and I'm not ashamed to say this, but you know when bulk trash comes, that's like one of my favorite times because I am scrounging through the neighborhood trying to find things. And I had a neighbor who was going to get rid of five um, 55 barrel drums and, and they're really cool. They're terracotta colored. And um, on them, it says like olives. So I think they must have used them to store olives. Not my neighbors, but like originally. So they wound up um, giving them to me. I think I, I actually gave them like 25 bucks. So look on Craigslist, look on next door, look at bulk trash. I guess the only thing with that is you kind of want to know what was used in those barrels. So I never use rainwater for my vegetable garden. I only use it for my ornamentals. So then you probably don't really have to worry so much what was in it, but um, check your local, you know, social media channels in your neighborhood too, to see if anybody's getting rid of stuff. Um, 
because then they're and then you're not driving all the way across town to to get um your rain barrels um with the rain barrels or rainwater harvesting ryan someone was asking about a flat roof um Yes, they're also, and they were also asking about French drains off the end of the patio to a collection area. Is there a good way to filter the water before distributing? So I guess two questions with that one is how do you do it off of a flat roof? And then more information about French drains at the end of a patio. Yeah, so good questions. As far as the flat roof goes, um, so I'm, I'm kind of building my picture of what the, what the kind of roof. So it, it might be a flat roof that just drains off to one side. Okay, so it's got open on one side and it just comes off and it drains. So there, if the water is just flowing off the flat roof into the landscape and you can shape the landscape to slowly spread and sink the water where you need it, perfect. If not, adding gutters. So adding a gutter to that strip so the water will collect in the gutter, downspout, and then get the water to where you need it. Um, either through a swell or, or connecting the downspout to a pipe and getting that pipe underground and pop up where you need it. Um, other flat roofs, um, typically there's a paraffin wall that goes all the way around the, the roof area. And then there's the big, um, you know, the scuppers. They're either round or square. And that's where water comes shooting out when it storms on a really big storm. So how to, to you know, utilize that water? Well, if you can get it to direct down with the rain chain or you know get it to move out without doing gutters that's always my first approach however sometimes the gutters are needed and so in that scenario they would put a box a scupper box is what they call it and that would go over that uh, that scupper that's coming out of the parafoot wall and then there would be a downspout and then you can tie into that downspout either um you know, at the bottom of the downspout, create a swell to get the water to convey where you want it or connect a pipe to the downspout and get the water to pop up where you need it. As far as the French drains, um, French drains and then, you know, they're a good, uh, they're a good feature to use where, um, especially creating off the patio, you can get them to convey water to where you want them to, you know, as well. So for example, that's exactly that's the first water harvesting project that I did was create a French drain. It was for the, the patio area. The water comes off the roof and I wanted to get down and directed under to where the trees were. And then I put my flagstone on top of it. And so um, once you get your French drain in place and you wrap and cover it, you know, you usually will just add rock on top. The, the filtering is a good question because over time, the French drains will fill up with sediment. And that's, <laughs> and actually, that's the, um, my only reason why it's not my go-to feature is because I like to use a basin to where I can see if it fills up full sediment or if it needs more mulch. Um, so yeah, your French drains over time will fill up the sediment and uh, they might have to be maintained. But as far as to keep out of it, if you can, um, other things that come to mind is if you have a, you know, a row of um, some plants before it gets to the French drain, that's going to help filter that out. Um, but also too, I'm trying to envision what kind of uh, debris that you might have. So if there's other ways of cleaning that debris off before it gets into your French drain. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, and Ryan, I don't have much experience with the French drains. I'm kind of the same, you know, in my, um, after taking the permaculture design course and your classes and Brad's classes, I, you know, immediately went out to my front yard and I just, you know, okay, we're gonna just dig a basin. And, um, you know, that, that is very visual. Um, and that's, that's how we passively harvest rainwater. We do, we do both. We have passive rainwater harvesting with our, our uh, swales and uh, basins and berms. And then um, also through the, the tanks. Um, yeah, so that's, I don't have any experience with the French drains. So that's good to know that they do get clogged up and you need to filter them. Yeah, um, yeah, but it, there again, too, it, it all depends on how much sediment you have. <laughs> and so I, I did mine in 2005, and they seem to still be working. Water sinks in where it needs to. So, yeah, um, but French drains are good that if, if you need a flat surface and you can't have a dip or, you know, a basin. So, yeah, definitely good features, but I'm with you, Joanne. I, I like basins. That's my, pers that's my personal preference. Yeah, like they just they build kind of cool too. It's funny because when um, we first were digging it out, my husband and I, um, all of our neighbors were like, "What are you guys doing?" You know, and it's just it's 
something as simple as that was kind of catching on in our neighborhood. So I, I like it because it is kind of a visual um, and it makes a statement. Um, so questions on gray water, um, a lot of questions about soap. So that's great that people are, are get that, you know, that, hey, whatever they're putting down the drain, if they're putting on their ornamentals uh, or even their um, uh, edibles, you know, how is that going to impact their soil ecology, the plants? Um, I referred people to Brad's page on soaps. Can you give us soap 101? Yeah, so yeah, soaps is a good um, good thing to be thinking about if you're using gray water because soaps soaps are typically high in salt. And what are our soils? What is it usually high in? Salt. And so we don't want to be adding more um, alkaline to our soil. So by looking for soaps that don't contain any um, uh, any sodium, or if it is you know plant based, would be better. Where um, uh, no chlorine or, or borax, you know, that kind of thing. You want to think about um, the type of soap. If <laughs> you send it out to the plants. And so it would, it's all about the either soil that you're watering. Okay, so you're watering the soil. So you don't want things that are going to be um, breaking down the soil and causing problems with the soil. Uh, so, but the big ones here is definitely the, the, the sodium that you're wanting to avoid. And then uh, of course, all those other uh, different chemicals, which are typically the, you know, the things that get your clothes wider and brighter, but uh, there are some good soaps out there. Um, just a couple that I've used personally is Ecos is one, ECOS and Oasis soap is another, but it, all your soaps might, you know, you might be using the right type of soap now. And so um, there's a website called ecologycenter.org and they have a fact sheets website. So that's ecologycenter.org and then forward slash fact sheets. And they've done a good job. And gosh, they've kind of, they kind of um, held back a little bit just because the, the manufacturers, they'll change their recipes and it's just really hard to keep up with all the different products that are out there. But the main thing is look at your product that you're currently using and does it contain any of the things that are on that harmful list? So, um, so definitely uh, keep that in mind. And uh, also too, these are things to keep in mind that if we're putting our water down the sewer, because your water that's going down the, the drain is getting turned into a resource. And so, uh, so that's a good thing too. And the less salt that we put down our sewer, it's gonna be easier to clean and get that water out when it's um, um, you know, going through the recycling process and getting back into reclaimed water. Ryan, I thank you so much for that because it's almost like your timing is impeccable because it's Thanksgiving, right? You know, next week. And in our operations, so, you know, this class is sponsored by the Glendale Water Services Department. Um, you know, not only do we provide your water, but we also treat your water. And you were exactly right, Ryan. We don't want, um, you know, stuff going down the sewer that is going to uh, hurt our water treatment plants. Um, also with Thanksgiving coming up, you know, don't pour fats, oils, and grease down your drain. So a lot of people think that, oh, I'm just going to run hot water or run the garbage disposal. Really all that is doing is that it's just pushing the fats, oils, and grease um, a little bit further through your pipes. And it, it kind of, um, I, I call it like cholesterol. It just, it just fills up uh, your pipes and can lead to blockages. Um, so really, we always tell people there's only three P's that should go down uh, the, the toilet, the drains, and that's, you know, when you go to the bathroom, um, toilet paper, so that being a P, and then uh, what's the other, uh, yeah, toilet paper, P and poop. So sorry, I said that. Um, but those are the only things that we want down the sanitary sewer. So yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because it's really timely with Thanksgiving. We do try and get that message out there. Um, oh, thanks, Anne. Anne is on it. She already has the link to the fats, oils, and grease. That's awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. And your landscape doesn't want those either. <laughs> so yeah, don't send your oils or, uh, you know, that kind of out to the landscape because it could do the very same thing where it will seal the, basically, instead of clogging that artery in the pipe, it will put a layer on the soil to where the water won't want to percolate through. And uh, yeah. So those uh, definitely should not be going down any drains, uh, for sure. That's aw that's awesome timing. It's like we planned it, but we didn't. That's awesome. I love that. Um, and then someone asked me personally if, if my rain tanks, if my rain barrels are empty, they are empty. 
except I do always keep a, a barrel underneath our air conditioning condensate. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't fill up, but every once in a while I'll kick it over onto the grass, um, the, the little area of grass that we have in our backyard. So I am like, I am on it. We're just, you know, no wasted water. It is such a precious resource in the desert that uh, we're, we're harvesting everything that we can. I will say, um, and I may have mentioned this at a, at a past class, but um, years ago, my husband and I knew that we were very antisocial because we were at a party and it was during the monsoon season and it started to rain. We're like, well, we got to go. We got to like get the tanks ready. And like, I, I think that's when you know that you're really like, you know, into something or you're antisocial or have awkward skills. But the way our tanks are, we have to undo the lids on some of them. And so, um, you know, the, it's just that we're really into it. What can I say? Yeah. Um, I reveal too much in these classes. Okay, Ryan, I think that's it as far as questions, but just a lot of appreciation and thanks. I wish you could see all the, the chats, the, the thank yous, and this is such great information. Um, yeah, thank so. You, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you saved us. Um, since the class is ending, I'll let everyone know that uh, Ryan literally stepped in about four hours ago to um, help teach this class because our first presenter, um, unfortunately, I had to cancel due to um, feeling under the weather. So you have saved our gravy or saved our skin. What, what is that expression? <laughs> oh, I'm not sure, but I'm happy, happy to do so, definitely. And, and thank you everyone for attending tonight. And, and I, I wish you the best of luck of going out there and, and making your sustainable landscapes. And, and definitely, uh, well, I should have mentioned too, if you had any questions, you can reach out to the City of Glendale, but Watershed Management Group's uh, uh, email or website and, and phone number there. Watershed Management Groups, you know, they also provide virtual consultations too. So even though based down in Tucson, um, they're doing a lot virtual now. Uh, I'm here local. If, if I can help out, there's my contact information as well. But definitely, uh, the best thing is just get out there and start making some changes and uh, create the landscape that you want to enjoy. Awesome. Well said, Ryan. I can't even cap that. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you, Anne. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys. Have a happy and safe Thanksgiving.